Service design is by its very nature, a highly collaborative practice. This is one of the reasons why we love it so much. But it also means that you can't get anything meaningful done on your own. You always have to convince someone to share their resources with you, whether it's their time, money, or attention. And this goes for both external clients and internal stakeholders. But how do you do that? How do you get people on your side? How do you get them to buy into your plans and ideas? Well, that's what you're going to hear in this episode. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome to the Service Design Show. I have found that many service design professionals rely on a form of hope as their main strategy. Hope that they will say the right things at the right time to the right people. Now, while hope is really powerful and something that you definitely shouldn't use, it's probably the least effective strategy in this case. But hey, I can't blame them. The service design textbooks don't teach you how to clearly communicate the benefits of your work in a professional context. They just assume you know. But as it turns out, it's a bit harder than it looks. And what ends up happening is that you eventually get stuck and frustrated. Stuck working on the small and incremental stuff that you feel don't make any meaningful difference and frustrated by the fact that you're missing out on opportunities to work on bigger and more fulfilling challenges where you know you could have made a bigger impact. And the worst of it all is that you're not only cutting yourself short, but also the people who would benefit from a design-driven approach if you could only get them to see the value of it. Well, the truth is you can. You only need to exchange your strategy of hope for a set of proven tools, methods, and frameworks. Recently, a fresh group of professionals graduated from my Selling Service Design with Confidence program where they learned about these tools, methods, and frameworks. And in this episode, they're going to share the most valuable learnings with you. So if you are also struggling to get your CEO, manager, or client to fully buy into the benefits of service design, grab your notebook and start making notes because there's a lot to unpack in this episode. Finally, if you want to get on the waiting list for the third and last cohort of the Selling Service Design with Confidence program this year, head over to servicedesignshow.com slash confidence. The cohort is scheduled for October, but there is a limited number of seats available. So to increase the chance that you'll be able to secure a spot, make sure you name gets on the waiting list as soon as possible. Head over to servicedesignshow.com slash confidence for all the details and you'll also be able to find the link in the show notes of this episode. In our busy lives, it can be very hard to find the time and most of all permit yourself to invest in your professional growth. But if you want to have more mature conversations with business leaders and find the opportunities to work on more fulfilling challenges, I can only encourage you to take a look at the program. But hey, don't take my word for it. Let's dive into the stories of the service design professionals who did. Let the show begin. Welcome to the show, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hey, Hey, good to see you all. Happy that you made it all the way till the end of this journey. This journey called Selling Service Design with confidence. Um, We're going to do... uh, a graduation call, a call to uh, give back to the community and celebrate with each other that you uh, come so far, uh, share some practical lessons, uh, maybe share some of the challenges that you have been running into. It should be a lot of fun. And I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your stories um, at the end of this program. We have seven participants and I have to start somewhere. And today we're going to start with Sweden and uh, Dimitris, you're, you're first. So could you give a brief introduction? Who are you and what do you do these days? Yes. Uh, hello, Mark. Hello, everyone. So my name is uh, Dimitris. Uh, I was as a, as a UX and service designer. Uh, I have jumped, uh, just jumped in on a new role in a new company. So uh, everything is like really fresh. Uh, I have been uh, working and still work uh, uh, mostly in-house. Uh, and this is my first um, role that's mostly going towards uh, service design. Previously, I've been, been working most, mostly with uh, UX design. All right, uh, cool. Uh, I see a lot of people who are transitioning into service design. 
get into these questions and I can imagine that, um, yeah, this was also interesting for you. Now, um, you've transitioned from your art transitioning from your UX to service design. Uh, I'm curious, what kind of challenges did you encounter when you try to communicate the benefits of service design? So mostly it has been that uh, uh, other stakeholders have been like uh, reckless to invest in uh, and give time for um, research. Uh, so they mostly want to jump into solutions right away. Uh, and this has been the part that's mostly been challenging, trying to give show the value of why we should like uh, invest in more, more research and looking at the in the product or the service like with a little bit more of design mindset. Hmm. And um, now th we hear that more often that uh, stakeholders find it challenging or find it hard to invest in research. But what was the consequence for you of that? Uh, mostly not be able, uh, not getting uh, time, resources, and uh, any backing to do any research, uh, which made it really hard to actually show the value and uh, uh, give me time and energy and uh, the resources to do what uh, we want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to actually, quote unquote, do proper service design or proper. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Cool. Yeah, work a little bit more with like the first uh, diamond of the uh, design thinking process, which is like. Uh, yeah, the, the the biggest problem that people want to jump to the mm. second one. Yeah, because we all know our customers and users and clients already like, why should we do research, right? Um, exactly. <laughs> the classic. Uh, I'm curious, um, was there anything in the program that you were able to take away and that helped you to sort of maybe not solve this problem because I don't think these problems, you can actually solve them, but maybe um, get over it a bit easier? Yeah, I mean, there were like several parts. Uh, I think the one that stick most to me was uh, being able to connect uh, design to growth and costs and a little bit uh, talk about that uh, business mindset and uh, actually give um, numbers and the capacity to be able to talk with uh, the people that actually take those decisions and show them why service design uh, is and should be help me make uh, make those decisions and uh you meant something about numbers that's usually not uh a very common ground for service designers like how were you able to use numbers in order to get into these conversations uh, by showing and actually connecting uh, uh, growth and costs so that could be to like for example uh, show that uh, a specific uh, uh, action could in, could uh, you could uh, lead to increasing sales, uh, increasing profits, or maybe uh, increasing market share, uh, or looking at the costs that can be decreased by using service design, uh, such as, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe like fastest delivery of or uh, taking away like one step of the process that actually is uh, more of a hindrance than actually helps uh, customers. Hmm. Hmm. Makes sense. How, how is this different than maybe how you used to approach this? Uh, well, because this, and this is one of the things like uh, I, uh, I learned in the show that try to help the stakeholder uh, you're working for to make those uh, arguments to their boss. And this is not something that I did uh, earlier or uh, I tried to. Uh, I think that would be like the most uh, important thing. Hmm. You help your stakeholder to actually sell service design. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, finally, what I would love to hear from you is if you have like one tip for somebody who's listening and maybe experiencing the same challenge, because I know that this is a common challenge. What what advice would you give them? Uh, to learn to ask the right questions, which sounds really easy but like so hard so hard of an art to master and um, master the art of storytelling because knowing the numbers and being able to to show them is like one part but the other part is that you actually have to say it in a way that people will understand it and uh where would people learn good storytelling oh well, that's a, another question i mean i got some really good uh, tips from you um 
but I think you have had some uh, maybe in, in the show people talking about it. Uh, yeah, yeah, that could be a place to start. And I agree. There are a few episodes on the service design show that focus on stories and storytelling and the power of stories. So, um, yeah, that would definitely be a good starting point. Anything else, Dimitris, or was this it? Uh, no, nothing for me. If you don't have any other questions. No, I think this is a good summary and happy to hear that you sort of made progress through this program. Um, good luck in your new role and uh, thanks. And I'll move on to our next participant, uh, which is Max. Hey, Max. Hey, Mark. Hey, uh, same question to you. Uh, let's start with um, where are you based? What do you do? And no, let's just start. Let's keep it simple. Let's start with that. Uh, I'm based in Munich. Um, I work currently for a, yeah, in an agency set up as an in-house design team. Um, before I was working in an agency, so I can have a bit of both experiences. Uh, I was trained as a product designer originally in Delft in the Netherlands and uh, yeah, ended up in service design because I like that the outcome is open and not fixed. Hmm. Yes, yes, that's one. That's that's the beauty of service design and also the challenge while selling it at the same time. Um, exactly. I'm also curious from you. You uh, have been on the agency side. Now you're in house. Um, if you had to identify, yeah, let's let's start with this question. If you had to identify, what is more challenging, uh, selling service design, being on the agency side, or selling service design when you're in house? At this day, I'd say uh, in-house because we also are in the position to actively approach our clients um, and tell them how we can help them. And I, I know that's a different situation than when maybe your client approaches you with pain points or some expectations or thoughts. At least then the conversation is coming from two directions. Well, we also often start uh, in a conversation where we think there can be added added value of using service design. And then there's not necessarily a clear pain point experience yet. So we need to dig deep. Hmm. That's interesting. I think a lot of people who are on the outside sort of uh, envy the, the people who are on the inside and think that it's much easier like selling it and operationalizing it, but apparently it brings its own challenges, which I've heard more often. Um, if you had to pick one challenge, like what's, what's a struggle that you've experienced with communicating benefits to internal stakeholders? Um. The, the first one is, is indeed finding pain points. I mean, in, in many cases, people are doing their projects, they're doing their thing. Uh, they get familiar with agile way of working. Uh, they're, they're obviously on, on a good way. Um, and there are multiple things on their agenda that they could do to go one step further. Um, so then next to, next to that, you also end up talking about timing. Um, and then often service design feels as something that could be, can be done later or as really in general, I think, and, and something extra to think about the customer a bit more deeper. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's an add on. It's a nice to have, like, uh, when everything works, then, uh, we'll at some point have time to do service design. That seems like quite a big, uh, challenge, um, did the program give you anything that that you were able to take away and use to maybe solve this again solving is probably not the right word but move you forward yeah don't be hesitant <laughs> uh, yeah of course uh, in a way that i mean i had some arguments or stories available uh, but I think I was looking for a way um, to structure them and to find the right order. Um, I could literally talk for hours about my wonderful discipline and my job. And that's, of course, definitely not the solution, but where to start then and how to build your story. Um, and what I learned uh, from the course and what works really well for me is to ask the clients uh, first, of course, about the big goal and then about their challenges. That's the mountain exercise we learned in the course. Um, because this gives a great entry point to tell also about the uh, more soft or short-term service design benefits, like bringing stakeholders together, uh, start seeing the benefits of listening to your users, 
And that was something that I was always struggling with because it's something that can, yeah, not really be expressed in numbers or less easy um, on one hand. And it's also something that I really like about my job. I really like that that's one of the benefits. Um, but by asking the client first about their challenges, achieving the bigger goal, it gives me a great entry point to tell about these benefits that mm. they will experience on the short term. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's that's interesting. I think um, we love our work. We love what, what it can bring, uh, how it can transform organizations, how it can transform businesses. So whenever people ask us, we're more than willing to talk and share about it, but that's not per se the best way to, to actually get people to literally buy in. They might be interested to hear this, but it doesn't mean that they will actually give you a challenge or an assignment or the trust to work on a project that's on a challenge that they are working in, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hmm. Now, um, also uh, the question for you, if you could give somebody who's in a similar situation, maybe also in a house and is struggling with the same thing, like one tip that could maybe help them move forward, what would that be? Um. Yeah, the, the, the simple answer, or at least one that I said, is the, the mountain exercise. Talk not only about the bigger goals, but also about the, the challenges. Uh, but then added to that one, indeed, sit together and talk about the roadmap to uh, avoid ending up on the, on the shelf and, and telling you that service design maybe should come in later when they're finished doing other things. But also showing the client by doing an exercise together that it does fit in with all the other things that they are doing already. And it can, um, yeah, how do you say this? Connect all the, all the projects in such a way that you maybe even get more value out of everything you're already doing. Uh, show that service design is not a single exercise that you just do for a few months on its own, um, but it can really improve all the single activities or initiatives that you're doing yeah. Mm. yeah so basically like doing a stakeholder map but then just for projects or goals or activities to understand the context in which you're going to operate as a service designer right yeah yeah awesome uh thank you uh this was really helpful and uh good to hear that you're also moving forward uh thanks max and um let's move on to our next participant and that's going to be let me grab my notes manuel are you there yes hello mark hey manuel uh same question to start with uh for you uh could you describe your situation today uh a bit yep i'm currently based in denmark I'm working in-house as a UX designer. Um, however, after the course, I'm also uh, thinking about the ways service design could benefit the, the startup I'm working in. Hmm. Um, I'm curious, what, um, what was your motivation to join a program that is about selling service design with confidence? Hmm. I think it all started by listening to the podcasts uh, in Spotify. And I was um, listening to the different uh, uh, people sharing their expertise. And uh, I just wondered about this idea that you mentioned several times throughout the show, the, the double binds. And I had been facing those throughout my career. So I, I just had the feeling that this could be a, an interesting road to go down. And uh, for the people who haven't listened to every episode of the service design show, like what was the double bind? Uh, what is the what are double binds, and which double bind is specifically that you encountered that made you think, well, this might be something that I need to dig deeper into. Well, uh, the way I understand double binds is uh, these sort of requests that have contradicting uh, endings. So, uh, an example that uh, I usually face is. Um, having a stakeholder ask for innovation, but at the same time, they want the project to follow a straight line and have a very uh, strict time frame. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not uh, sensible when talking about design because you 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 learn as you go through the process, and there's insights and and ideas that that emerge that just invite for the project to iterate rather than to finish in a specific day. 
Yeah, yeah. The, those are, we have many of them. And if uh, somebody who's listening right now wants to dig deeper in some of these double binds, it's the episode with Chris Ferguson and David Dunn. Uh, there are two episodes on double binds. So uh, definitely worth checking out. So um, Manuel, related to communicating the benefits of service design, uh, what would you say was your biggest challenge? Mm, I think... Uh, speaking the right language um it's easy to think that other other roles misunderstand design and trying to approach them using the design lingo might just fall on deaf ears so through through the course i think that what that was one of the biggest learnings i had uh thinking about reaching out to people understanding their fears their goals and also their language to be able to um, come up with a way to explain design in their own terms. Mm. It's interesting uh, because when you say the right language, that that is quite an abstract thing. Like, how would you define the right language today? Like, what have you seen is the right language? I, yeah, maybe there's no single definition because the right language depends on the person you're talking to, the client you're addressing. So that's exactly why uh, we need to talk to people, to interview mm. them, to uh, ask questions, to get to know their language and, and be able to speak on the same level. And, and was that also something that you found inside the program, uh, like an, I don't know, an exercise tool or framework that helps you to actually do that? Um, yes, I think the the... The, the basic questions that that you should uh, reach out to to the different stakeholders where you try to um, understand what is valuable to them in their projects to see what keywords they use when referring to what means uh, progress or, or success for them and it's i've always find that interesting that in in a lot of cases, these questions are very similar to the ones that we ask our end users, but somehow we don't apply this knowledge and this practice and these tools to the people we're working with. Have you found something similar? Yes, exactly. Uh, it's uh, funny because uh, we usually have uh, different methods and tools to follow a design process but we forget that sometimes with these kind of challenges we can also apply our own design skills so basically interviewing your audience testing your assumptions uh, preparing even scripts to when when starting a new conversation are very helpful hmm. yeah we're we're also working with humans and they aren't that much different than and users, uh, so uh, a lot of our tools and methods definitely do apply over there as well. Um, have you, um, I'm curious, have you seen, um, and have you tried it in practice and how did it work? Did you, were, were you able to see a difference in how people respond to you or something like that? Um, I'm in the process of, uh, of applying this. Uh, I'm starting by talking to people and trying to, uh, get the goals that they have in their in their heads i'm still midway down so i um, don't have any concrete results at the moment do do people open up when you ask them these questions because i can imagine this might be one of the things holding people back like ah, they're not going to share anyway but do people open up yeah yeah for sure i i do i can compare the first time i approach trying to uh talk about the the different tools i use in design and and even talking about the venn diagram where you have like the feasible versus the desirable and and the business side of things but uh, i i got the response that i shouldn't try to force my process on others but once you start asking what they want what they value you immediately get different answers and you don't get that pushback hmm. yeah and people don't get defensive. People like talking about themselves in general. Uh, so uh, that's that's a good approach. Uh, Manuel, I'm also going to ask you this question. Like, um, if you had to share one tip with the service design community about communicating the benefits of service design, which tip would you give? 
my I, I go back to looking to speak the same languages as, as the audience you're reaching out okay uh fair enough uh and uh it's it's not with these things like uh it's an easy uh, it's an easy tip but it's hard to implement so uh thank you for that and um let's keep that uh laser sharp on our minds let's write it down so we're gonna post it uh thanks manuel for sharing and i'm going to move on to uh participant number four if i'm not mistaken kiki uh also from very close to me the netherlands uh kiki are you there yes hey mark hey kiki good to see you um uh, you're also in a different context compared to the other three participants could you share a little bit about that Yes, uh, I work as an in-house uh, service designer for the municipality of Amsterdam, so the city, uh, government, local, big, slow moving, you know the drill. Uh, and before uh, I worked for agencies, so I've also seen both sides. Um, um, yeah, and it's a big transition. <laughs> mm, interesting. Uh, and uh, once again, I do think that people on both sides sort of envy some aspects of the other side. So the grass is always greener. Where you gave it water. That was the uh, <laughs> that was the uh, the saying, I think. Uh, so, Kiki, I'm curious to your experience um, with regards to the challenges and roadblocks uh, when you need to communicate the value of service design. What have you found to be the biggest challenge? Well, I think in a big local government, uh, one of the main challenges is that it's a very big organization and people don't always know what they can use you for, which often results in in being part of the conversation too late. So maybe there has even been a big analysis phase, but they didn't know that you could add value in that phase. So often the moment I get involved, there is already a solution on the table that might not actually solve the thing that they originally started with, but uh, yeah. So getting getting involved too late is I think uh, uh, one of the main struggles that we're dealing with. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and th and that's that's sounds like super frustrating to me. Like when you know that you could have added value and maybe shaped sort of the challenge and helped everybody forward, uh, and then you're know, sort of too late. Like, what's the consequence of that? Do you get to start over, or do you have to work with the things that are already on the table? Like, yeah, usually it's the second. So so you you are trying to reshape it but it's often too late there are deadlines there's new policies coming in so you you need to work with what you have um so what i try to do now based on the course is is try to get a little hook in so for next time they know that i can also be of value earlier on in the process um yeah so uh yeah that's what i try to do now that that, that sounds like magic like how do you do how do you uh get uh people to see that you could add value before they actually have a, a challenge or a question because that's what i'm getting from your star how do you do that well that's something i really learned during this course that that when we talk about selling my main association especially at the beginning of the course was the sleazy car salesman who is trying to push you into doing this whole thing right now and I learned that selling is actually an ongoing small conversation and small steps towards the right goal is, is still small steps in the right direction. And I think especially in a big organization like mine, the small steps are super valuable. So next time they can, they can find me easier or know what I can add to the conversation earlier on. So, um, how is that different than maybe the approach you had, I don't know, six months ago? I think six months ago, I was I was trying to change the organization overnight. And now I've realized, okay, I, I need to take small steps and appreciate the small steps I can take and, and celebrate the small wins uh, in the process in order to get to the place we want to go. Uh, and at the same time, yeah, by proving the work and showing the work, we also yeah get more of a name within the organization and and get a more uh, important position create ambassadors who sell basically our work for us so uh, yeah that's been very useful uh, so far i think mm. the small wins maybe we need to add like an asterisk to the uh program title and should be selling service down with confidence and patience <laughs> because, <laughs> because that's that's a really key part uh not losing hope and uh keeping sight of the bigger picture and um yeah celebrating the small wins if you think about small wins um 
what do you see? Like, could you give an example of a small win that you maybe had in the previous weeks? Say uh, definitely, yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, one of the things that we, one of the exercises we do do during the um, course is uh, asking someone for feedback after a project. So, um, I've asked one of my colleagues who has actually I've done a project for him, and he's come back to me to ask me to do another project for him. Uh, I asked him what was the added value for you, and that was super valuable for me to learn what his needs are and to understand. Uh, what what I can solve for him, which will help me in understanding how I can solve that for other people as well and understand. Yeah, basically, as, as Manuel was saying before, use our own surface design skills to understand the issues and the language uh, that the person has in front of you that you're trying to convince to use your set of skills uh, uh, for their benefits. Hmm. I, I love this exercise. I call this uh, debriefing your client. Uh, in this specific case, did they describe, did it match your expectation? No. Uh, no? Okay. I don't know. Can you share uh, something that they said that surprised you? Yeah. So I, I helped this person in making a blueprint uh, and and uh, sketching out a process, a non-existing pro process and, and trying to get everyone around the table and trying to... And, and what I expected was that the result, the deliverable was going to be the most valuable for this person. But actually what he said was, no, um, you opened everyone up. And at the beginning of the two hour session, everyone was really grumpy and they didn't want to say anything. And by the end, everyone was super intrigued and said, oh, we should do this more often. And that was actually the biggest added value for, for yeah, this person so mm. uh, yeah it was lovely to hear it's it's awesome to get these stories just also for your own morale and your yeah, confidence and um the, i don't think a lot of people realize that you can sort of use uh these quotes as testimonials um because at the start it's really hard to quote unquote sell the value of helping people to open up but if it's not you communicating the value but you can sort of uh, point to well um, my five other clients have said that this is the benefit they get from it then uh, it's like it out of um, it's not you trying to convince somebody else this is just like this is what we do and this is the value people get out of it did you experience something similar um, well, I haven't actually used it yet in that context. Do it. Make uh, it into a testimonial. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have made like a mental note that I should do this debriefing after every project to understand what the needs are and, and understand how I can facilitate it, those needs. So uh, hopefully soon I can give you more answers. Yeah. That. And it's, it's often uh, people, it's hard to define the needs at the start. And sometimes throughout the design process, uh, things come up that you weren't able to articulate at the start. So it's always smart to, at the end, go over this once again. Like, did we come up with something else that was even more valuable than maybe we anticipated uh, at the start? So, yeah. Um, all right, Kiki. Uh, also, if somebody is maybe in a municipality as well, a big organization where change isn't, um, innovation maybe isn't uh, one of the key uh core values maybe it is but i don't know if they are struggling to sell service design what would you tell them yeah uh, i think it's gonna be a bit of a repeat of what i already said but uh, uh celebrate the small wins and, and if a client comes back or to me that's already like amazing because i was able to portray uh what the value was of the work that i did so um yeah be be mindful that the small step in the right direction even though it's a small step it's a step mm. um uh, yes yeah, so celebrate that celebrate the small wins yeah small steps uh definitely uh, reflect on that uh cherish them uh, and then sort of keep uh, moving and grinding forward. Thanks for sharing, Kiki. Uh, really cool. And I'm sure we'll be uh, in touch about your progress. Um, and now I'm moving on and taking the airplane to fly across the North, North Sea uh, all the way to Birmingham. That's going to be a flight of, I don't know, well, 90 minutes, maybe even less. Hey, Martin, are you there? Hey, yes, I am. Hey, cool. I'm here, from, here from London today. London. Well, look at that. That's even shorter. Uh, uh, Martin, uh, you also have a different background than the uh, previous participants. Um, what do you do? 
So I've actually recently accepted a job as service design manager at BT before I was service designer. Uh, and before that, uh, I worked in-house um, at a transport authority um, in the West Midlands. Mm. Yeah, so you, you have quite a lot of experience with big organizations. BT, for the people who aren't from the UK, is British Telecom. So every country has its own uh, equivalent. Uh, so you should be able to relate. Now, um, I'm, I'm guessing that there are many challenges. But if you had to pick one, <laughs> communicating the value of service design internally, um, what do you run into? Like, what are the challenges? I think that size is the single, single biggest challenge that we have in that um, our team in digital is, is so big that we're constantly running into new people. Uh, and, and because of the size of BT more generally, um, if you think of our, all of our services, they're delivered by like tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so there's so many silos. There must be thousands of silos within the business. And it's trying to get to speak to everybody and also onboard them into kind of like the world of service design um, that they probably haven't happened across before. Mm. And um, what does that mean for your work that there are, are so many people, so many silos, like? It, it means that often when you think the work is done, there's uh, a lot more work to do. Um, and communicating um, to as many people as possible about service design can be really challenging um, just because you, you never really know um, who's entirely in the service. Um, something that I've particular that I um, found was when I was working with a design lead from a product design background, hadn't really um, experienced service design that much, but he just kind of would say, um, I don't really get value of what service design is. And um, when you're used to doing uh, a script, like you can uh, kind of wheel out your five examples of how um, service design um, it will, will kind of help um, because they'd done bits of service design. They were like, why, why is that a separate role? Um, so having to go back to the uh, beginning, kind of convince um, it, convince them that it's a good idea and kind of allow you to give them that aha moment that usually comes whilst you're uh, working on a service design project. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I can imagine that uh, you have to... It, one of the things that I see happening is um, people improvising on the spot. Now, I definitely think that improvisation is a key skill for any, any service designer, but uh, it helps to have some grounding and some stories that you own and that you sort of can iterate on improve test like you're almost doing stand-up co uh, comedy which is also very rehearsed and practiced uh maybe, maybe that's i think uh throughout the program we talked about this uh, uh selling service design to stand-up comedy but that's uh that's a different program <laughs> uh martin i'm curious um what did you take away from the program what was your key insight I think to continually probe, um, probe the client problem uh, or our internal problems, but with a really open mindset. I think that I learned a lot from the way that I communicate through the program, especially the kind of um, showing the pitfalls and kind of the traps that you fall into. And I recognized a lot of those uh, in terms of um, when you're in that big organization, you kind of want to be confident um, and, and when something's not going your way so much, um, you do close up a little bit and um, you end up having um, a bit of a closed discussion that's not really going anywhere. Um, and, and this kind of helped me to dig away and kind of bring people with you on the journey by really working with them on their story um, because they want to succeed as much as you do, right? And especially internally, they want a really big success story. And if you can help them get there, then that's great. So taking a fresh approach and um, communicating differently is what I've taken away uh, fr from this uh, program. And if you had to summarize when you say I communicate differently or I, I have a different approach to communication right now, like what's the difference? 
I think the single biggest difference was that I realized that I was passive listening all the time. Um, and I think it is because it's learning a lot and kind of having to take it in, but at the same time, um, not engaging in that conversation. And that's the single biggest change that I've uh, made to how I'm working in the um, last couple of weeks. And I'm starting to notice the difference in terms of the uh, the, the answers that I'm getting back uh, and, and the relationships that we're building uh, with my work. So I'm, I'm curious if you can share something about that, like what is the difference that you're noticing? Uh, so you end up picking up on a lot of um, smaller cues and things that you can go and uh, investigate. So when you when I was passive listening, um, I would be kind of trying to multitask at the same time, but now I can really kind of hone in and go, oh, that's really interesting. Like. Uh, Today, we had a chat with some people that work on our um, interactive store uh, elements and like all the way through us kind of being able to um, think about how that impacted digital and how we could improve the relationship there and then kind of interject with, oh, and did you know that we can help with this? And we've got all of these things um, that, that can kind of, you can inject into the new product um, that we're building uh, and we ended up just like a way forward um, that was more conversations, but a lot more work and a lot more progress than would have been if I'd kind of gone, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. that's cool that you're doing that, okay. <laughs> you're not just consuming information, you're sort of, um, well, doing research. You're using these conversations to do research. Yeah, precisely. And uh, not just saying, uh, did you know about this, but also kind of finishing it off with a question so that um, the conversation is going somewhere rather than just kind of really closed kind of yes, no questions that don't don't go as far. In the in the program, uh, we do a little bit of role play and we practice with different scenarios and uh, these open ended and closed questions scenarios were really a big success. Uh, so I can imagine that, <laughs> that those were good practice rounds. Um, Martin, also, uh, I would love to hear from you. Uh, if you could share one tip with somebody who is struggling to sell service design, what tip would you give them? Fully understand um, your client's needs and what they're trying to get from it so that you can work towards that with them, not just assume. Mm. Uh, what they're trying to get to mm. every client's uh, different yeah and fully understanding it that might be the ambition if you ever get there that might be a, a different thing but uh, having <laughs> that ambition different. that yeah that's the that's good ambition uh to have um also martin uh thanks for sharing this is going to be super helpful and um yeah good to hear that you're making progress as well I think the next participant is maybe uh, even within the same block as uh, you are. Let's see. Lynn, where are you right now? Hi, Mark. Um, I'm in London. I'm Look at happy. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious uh, if you could also share um, what is your role these days? Sure. So I'm a uh, service design manager in Farfetch, which is an, uh, an e-commerce luxury fashion marketplace. Um, so I've actually worked in the capacity of a research manager prior um, within Farfetch, but certainly just recently started transitioning to service design and sort of uh, finding, you know, establishing this practice more so across the business. So it's just the beginning. Cool. Um, welcome on this journey. And it's going to be a long one, as we've heard. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, th that also makes me uh, wonder, like, if you're just, quote unquote, starting out, of course, you have an entire career uh, already, but uh, starting out in service design, why did you feel that uh, a program like Selling Service Design with Confidence would be something that would help you, that would benefit you? Well, that's a great question. I initially wanted to learn more about how I can be receptive to the different stakeholders that are around our business function that I'm in, which I sit in the consumer product uh, business function. So obviously working with marketing um, or let's say B2B functions across the business um, strategy, I think it was really just to help me sort of make 
a case for what we can do beyond just the short term. And so I wanted to make sure I can um, resonate with those stakeholders through this course that hopefully will give me the tools to um, speak business language in the context of design, which is the, the blind spot for them. Hmm. Was it um, was it like a, a preemptive move uh, that you thought, well, this is something I'm probably going to run into, or did you already had some experience with um, maybe conversations that didn't go as you planned? Um, I'm I'm pretty sure I knew that this is going to be a challenge in selling it, um, just because I think the company itself is quite tech driven to begin with. So there's a lot of reactive sort of initiative prioritizations across the business. So a lot of times we felt we were sort of in the dark about, well, why are we actually doing this? What is the value? Yes, we see the business value, but what's the actual customer value? And coming from a consulting uh, career in the past, like that was sort of drilled into me to at least ask those questions and understand the problem from that angle. So I kind of knew this is something that was missing, especially when you're looking at a lot of different stakeholder presentations and business cases, there's never a customer case or there's never a customer angle that's sort of human. So I think that element of the story I felt um, is something that could potentially be addressed via service design and taking our stakeholders along that path. Um, so yeah, I did expect it. I didn't expect it to be this difficult, but you know, I think we're starting to you know, shape some good relationships in that direction. Yeah, it's, it's it. You know, um, it's not bad that these are challenging and tough conversations, um, right? It, it's it's part of it. And um, what's interesting about your context is that you're, like you said, in a product-driven, tech-driven environment, mm -hmm. and more and more service design professionals are in those environments, which is, which is on one side, it's great because we're getting to sort of infiltrate and. Um, evangelize this practice within those environments as well but often um you you are up against an army of engineers <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and um uh, you have to sort of keep your ground and um uh, yeah confidence helps with that um also i'm curious to hear from you if you look back at the last six weeks of the program uh you did a lot of things put in a lot of work but if you had to pick one thing that you took away or that you'll remember um, mm -hmm. as a key lesson, what would that be? I think for me, because I'm trying to make sure design as a mindset, service design as a mindset is embedded in our stakeholders approach, or at least have them open to it. I think for me is, is really trying to help reframe things that are very specific. And, and zooming out. I think that was a really nice takeaway, zooming out to the problem area um, and identifying a problem worth solving for. And I think some of the things that were mentioned prior around how do you bring business goals and customer value closer together? Like how do you in correlate the relationship between those, um, not only stronger, but earlier on in the story, earlier on in your dialogue with the stakeholder, I think will really help um, at least become a starting point, but also a reference point later on when the work has already begun. And I think it's really strong to have that as a backbone. So I, I think that's my main takeaway um, so far, which, you know, hopefully I'll continue to um, practice and exercise because every case is a bit different. But I think for me at this point, that was a strong takeaway. Hmm. And this is similar to what Kiki also uh, mentioned, like getting uh, getting into the conversation in the earlier stages. Mm -hmm. Were you able to sort of put this into practice? Did you have some, um, is, is there something that gives you a glimmer of hope that this is actually possible? Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many different projects going on at Farfetch and they're quite lofty projects around, you know, themes, as you may know, like sustainability being a big thing in fashion or even loyalty. But um, I think I have seen it um, as in within sustainability, we've got these lofty 2030 business goals and it seems great and it's out there, but how do you drill it back down to the customer experience? And it's sometimes that's sort of a, a void 
around what the customer proposition is in terms of how are we actually going to get there from 2023 to 2026 all the way to 2030. And so I think I've, I've been able to sort of use the techniques that were discussed in this program to, to again, go back to what are the things that are the actual moments and experience that has a an implication to the business goals? Like how do we make those relationships visible and evident in the storytelling. So I, I think I've seen more of that come through um, in my recent conversations with our sustainability um, product team. And we're hoping to draft a, you know, a sort of execution strategy to get to that lofty 2030 goal. But I think it's a really good, you know, light at the end of the tunnel here where I'm seeing it sort of, you know, open people's minds up a little bit about mm. the the outcomes. Mm. Yeah, and that's that's uh, also I'm going to refer back to Kiki. Like those are the small wings. Like if you can open right. the minds up, and it it's a process, it's a journey. It's going to take time. Have patience, mm -hmm. um, or, or or if you don't have patience, move to a different organization probably, which <laughs> which is going to have its own struggles. By the way, uh, so yeah. Um, also a question uh, to you, Lynn. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe. Um, no, let me rephrase it just uh, like this, like the tip, the ultimate or single tip you wish you maybe would have gotten um, before the program about communicating the benefits of service design. Oh man, there's so many to refer back to. Um, I think for me, it's just getting people excited about the vision and the outcome and then working together to create M missions that are worth you know going towards together and and bringing that momentum toward that vision together so i mean it's quite like a lofty easy thing to say but i think at least that structure for me is if you don't have a vision it's really hard to gain momentum even from the beginning so i think i, I think kind of going back to some of the things you said um in some of the course uh, instructions around you know, it's an art and a science and, and emotion plays a role in it. After all, we are people and complex problems involves people. And so I think that emotional element is quite key. All right. That's a, that's a good tip. And uh, it's um, like with all these things, uh, communicating the benefits, selling it, uh, building the confidence, it's a lived experience and you have to practice it and you sort of have to make mistakes uh and then that's the way you learn and um yeah with all these things it, it takes it takes time and practice art and science like you said um thanks for sharing uh lynn and um uh, i think we are ready to move on to the last but definitely not least uh participant in uh this uh episode and that is joe joe uh are you there yes i'm here hi mark uh, hey joe good to see you um also, the question to start with, uh, could you give us a brief introduction about who you are and what you do these days? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I run a small service design agency in Cardiff in Wales. Um, I work mostly with public sector organizations and third sector. Uh, I started off doing consultancy, but I've more lately moved into doing a lot more kind of capability and skills building <clears throat> with people. Um, so learning and development programs. Um, oh. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds cool. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, again, a different profile in this, uh, in this small community. Um, now, if you do training and you're doing consulting, like what were some of the challenges you experienced um, with regards to communicating the benefits of service design? Uh, I suppose I could kind of put that into two um, camps, if you like. So um, <clears throat> the initial thing that made me want to look at doing this was I was being asked by participants on our long six month program, how do we influence others in our organization? Um, and, um, you know, I, I have my views on that, but I thought this course might help um, kind of build my uh, toolkit to help share with them. <clears throat> Um, some some tips and methods that, that they could use. And I've certainly gone away with a few ideas on on how I can communicate that to 
uh, and help build their toolkit um, in turn. Um, but also I'd had a few um, kind of consultancy project things that I put, put in um, and they didn't turn into work. So I was like, hmm, what can I do about this? And how can I learn some better techniques to kind of um, bring people on the journey with me rather than kind of throwing the thing over the wall and hoping for the best. <laughs> mm, mm. <laughs> That's an interesting strategy. I've tried that uh, a lot, but <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work for me either. So uh, <laughs> that's maybe also one of the reasons why I started researching how to actually uh, do this kind of work. Um, so uh, a two-folded uh, question approach. Uh, uh, really interesting to hear uh, uh, which things you're going to communicate to your uh, students or participants, but we'll do that maybe in a later conversation. For now, I would like to focus on um, what did you take away from uh, the last six weeks? Because like you said, it's a lot, but if you had to pick a thing? Um, well, I think the, the big kind of overall takeaway is rather than kind of telling people stuff is ask them loads of questions. So um, that's the kind of big overall takeaway is really listen to understand so that you can kind of walk in their shoes and like, as I'm saying that out loud it's a bit like you know e eating our own dog food people say don't they um you know we're, this is what we're teaching people to do all the time but actually um you know sometimes it's worth holding a mirror up and going hang on we should take some of our own medicine here um <clears throat> so yeah asking asking lots of questions op open questions to really understand you know what their challenges are um and how you can add real value. Mm. Um, I think one of the other things is um, is to not just think of service design activity as a cost, um, and to think of the the long term value that this can be this can provide. Um, and the knock on from that is uh, thinking about how we measure the the outcomes from the work we do, um, which needs to be th thought about upfront when you when we do the projects themselves. Um, so yeah, once I start thinking about these things, it all kind of connects with <laughs> growth. It's uh, uh, it's interesting uh, to sort of focus on the thing uh, where you mentioned service, looking at service design not as a cost, um, because uh, I don't recall who said it uh, uh, in this conversation, but uh, service design becomes like the last thing that you sort of invest in when there is money left, maybe, or there is time left. Um, how do you frame it these days? If it's not a cost, how do you talk about it? An investment, um, and um, you know what? What value does this bring in the the medium to longer term? And kind of don't just think about short term ism. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, this is about providing long term value and. Like I said at the beginning, a lot of my clients are public sector organizations. So um, thinking not just about, I suppose, the bottom line. It's quite easy to measure success, perhaps, or probably not easy, but it's easier to measure um, if the work you do impacts on the bottom line. Um, but thinking a bit more creatively, perhaps, about how um, this work can kind of uh, I think the phrase you use is stop the leaking bucket, um, you know, increase compliance, for example, in public sector services um, and help organizations achieve their kind of strategic outcomes or priorities. Like how how can we m map what we're doing to achieving those goals? Yeah. And um, um, this is one of the big struggles where uh, for that, that service design often is something that pays off uh, on the long, medium to long term. And people, you have to find the right clients. You have to find the right challenges. They often don't present themselves right away. You have to look for them, search for them, try to connect um, yourself, your skills, uh, your toolkit with those bigger challenges. Um, but yeah, that there's, there is a way to do that. Yeah, I, de definitely. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, is there is there something you uh, you learned that 
uh, you were able to apply. And now, if you look back, my question is maybe, has your approach changed? Uh, yes. Um, I'm much more uh, thoughtful about conversations and I probably will plan conversations ahead, like thinking, okay, what's the goal here? Um, you know, what are some of the things I need to find out from from this conversation rather than just picking up the phone and launching it? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the inter again, that's a, a sort of it's good to reiterate that because if we are go and do our job and do research, we prepare. We we are really meticulous yeah. about preparing and thinking about stuff and making tools and making sure that we get the um, information and data we want. And somehow when it comes to talking with stakeholders or clients, we sort of wing it <laughs> often mm. uh, and and have hope and uh, as our best strategy. Well, that doesn't have to be the case. We can, uh, there are so many things we can do to make sure that the conversation is more productive, more fruitful, even if you get to a no, right? That's also one of the things we talked about in in the program. Getting to a no is also a result. Well, yeah, and understanding why, um, you know, it, if someone says no, it's not just, um, that's not just the end of the conversation, really understanding and digging under the no to, <laughs> to find out why. Um, um, and, you know, being prepared to walk away, but actually understanding Understanding why there, there and then might mean that you can actually take a few baby steps towards turning that into a yes, ultimately in the in the longer run. Mm -hmm. It's an, it's a no for this specific challenge, maybe, but it might be it might open up a door to a different challenge. Like there are so yeah, there are so many opportunities, and uh, again, if you approach this as a journey rather than a transaction, then it's it's just it's just another moment in this uh in this journey um so joe uh if we have to summarize and recap and you have the opportunity to give the final tip uh in this uh episode what would you say to somebody who's also maybe struggling to sell service design i think um really understanding the language of leaders and the finance people um, and speaking their language enough, you know, you're not going to become an accountant tonight, but um, <laughs> speaking their language enough. Um, but yeah, you can, you can connect with each other. And um, that is something that you can just learn, like learning their vocabulary and you don't have to, like you said, become uh, an accountant, but at least understand some of the terms that you are able to ask better questions, more grounded questions. Uh, I think that's um, a very easy and very smart strategy. Uh, sometimes I compare this to like, if you travel to a distant country, one of the ways to get the best tips for where you should be dining is to learn a few local words. Just greeting somebody in their local language is going to give you so much more empathy and probably a lot more better food dining tips and it's the same goes with the clients we work for like if we learn the language and drop in a few words then that's going to create trust uh, that's going to create empathy uh, and make our life easier and more fun that that's my summary of what you just said yeah <laughs> i really hope that you enjoyed this episode and learned something new how to communicate the benefits of your work in a professional context is something that we need to keep addressing in our community. Therefore, I'm really grateful that these seven professionals were willing to come on the show and share the journey with us. If you sometimes also feel stuck and frustrated because you can't seem to get the people around you to buy into the value of your work, and you see that this is preventing you from working on more meaningful and rewarding challenges, well, then developing the skills to sell service design with confidence might just be the right step in your career. As I shared at the start of the episode, the third and final cohort of the program is scheduled for October. That could be a few months away, depending on when you're listening to this episode, but there's already a waiting list that you can join. 
Getting your name on that waiting list increases your chance of securing a spot in the program as there is a limited number of seats available. For all the details and instructions on how to join the waiting list, head over to servicedesignshow.com slash confidence. So that's servicedesignshow.com slash confidence. And you'll also be able to find this link in the show notes of this episode. My name is Mark Fontijn and I want to thank you for being part of this community. Keep making a positive impact and I'll catch you very soon in a brand new episode of The Service Design Show. See you then.